Well, good morning and welcome to our Legacy Worship Hour. We're so glad that you could be with us here on this last weekend of February. And, you know, I'd like to start our worship time off together today by sharing with you a, a passage from the Apostle Paul on the subject of suffering. Now, we've experienced a, our own share of suffering this year, haven't we? And we're still not out of this thing yet. But I love the comparison that Paul makes in this verse I'm going to read for you between the suffering that we experience here and what God has for us yet to come one day in heaven. This verse is found in Romans chapter 8, and it's verse 18. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now let that just sink in for a moment. Think of all the suffering, all the hardship, all the difficulty that we've experienced as, as a nation, as people, through this season. Think about all the suffering in your life, everything you've gone through, all the bad things that have happened, and Paul says all of that, if you add it all up, it can in no way even compare with the glory, the wonder, the beauty of what we're going to experience one day when we're with him in heaven. And today as part of the message, I'm going to share with you a little bit uh, uh, what I like to call glimpses of glory. And I want to share a little bit of the w with you because we need to be thinking and looking forward to what God has for us one day in heaven. It's going to be so much better. All that we know down here is going to be fulfilled and completed in a wonderful way. And Paul says we can't even compare the hardships and the suffering and the difficulty with what is going to come one day in the future. So we look forward to that. We want to worship the Lord together this morning. And so I'm going to ask David to come and he's going to lead us in our first song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Celebration Church. My name is Ed Coe. I'm an intern here. 
And recently, I went to the barber. Can you tell? I got shaved. And while I was there, there were a couple of patrons who were talking about their COVID vaccinations. And one guy said, well, I had to wait an hour to get my card. And then I had to wait another hour to get my shot. And I was so tired of waiting, I didn't wait for the 15 minutes I was supposed to wait. I took off. This is quite a world we live in, isn't it? And you know, Celebration Church exists to minister to people who are encountering all sorts of challenges because Christ is the answer to many of the things we face. In fact, you could say he's the answer to all the things we face. There are four ways you can give to support the ministry of Celebration Church. First of all, you can go online, celebration-church.com slash give, and there are instructions there for how you can make an offering. Or you can, by using your cell phone, you can text the word give to 714-908-8843. You can also, if you're in the sanctuary, you can drop a contribution off at the gift box by the door, or if you're a resident of Town and Country Manor, you can drop your offering off at the front desk, and they will make sure we get it. And also, you can use snail mail. You can send an offering to the address of the church, 555 East Memory Lane, Santa Ana, California, 92706. And we would appreciate your contributions. The work of the ministry moves ahead on the prayers and the financial support and the, actually the lay ministry of the people who are part of the congregation. So we look forward for your support. And now uh, as we go to prayer, let's remember several things and uh, let's, let's go to God. Father, I thank you f- that you hear us and that you want us to talk to you, to lay everything before you, the big things and the little things, things that may not seem important to others, but are important to us. And so, Father, we do that. Father, first of all, we come with our request for our nation. Uh, We have very divided leadership. We have a change, a transition in leadership. We pray that you would be acting on the hearts of those who are leading our country, that they would be furthering your cause, that they would be doing the right thing, and that you would give them wisdom to do this. And Father, as we're in the midst of a pandemic, we ask that you would continue to protect us and that you would, you would give our doctors wisdom and that you would stop the hand of the pandemic. Uh, there's a tendency for us to rely on what man can do, but we know that you're the one who's ultimately in charge. You are the great physician. And so, Father, we, we look to you for that. We ask that you would comfort those who have had losses. We've had losses within our own uh, fellowship. And, Father, people have lost jobs. People have lost loved ones. People have been sick themselves. And, Father, we pray that your hand would be the hand of comfort on all of those who have been impacted by this terrible disease. And Father, finally, we want to remember uh, the Chapel on Wheels, the missionary emphasis for this week. We pray that you would continue to move ahead, even though they're not meeting in person, that they are meeting online, that you would continue to work on the hearts of the young people, and that you would continue to give them favor with the administration in the local schools, so that the program could resume in force once schools are reopened and the kids are back in classrooms. We pray that you would encourage the staff and the leadership of Chapel on Wheels and that your word would go ahead in the hearts of the young people. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we are in for a treat. We have some special music from Sammy and Begani. And uh, let's listen to them and worship God together.
Well, the chorus of that song, Lord, be lifted high, that ought to be our prayer request today, our petition before the Lord, is we want him to be lifted up, don't we, in all that we do. And I was just thinking as, the, as those two young ladies were singing for us today, how fortunate we are to have young people a part of our legacy worship. Sammy and Bagani are both interns with us here at Celebration Church, as many of you know, and they are both recent graduates of Simpson University in Redding, California. And so we are so glad to have them and, and also to have uh, David Cassay with us, uh, another young adult. It just, it just is so encouraging to have some of these young adults a part of our worship experience here at Celebration. And today we want to continue on our study in the book of Acts. And so I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 17. It's in Acts chapter 17 that we come to one of my favorite statements in all of the book of Acts. In fact, you know, when Paul began to make his presence felt in the city of Thessalonica, people cried out. And what did they say about Paul being in their city? We find these words in Acts 17 and verse 6. In response to Paul's ministry, the people cried out, These men who have upset the world have come here also. Now those words were spoken perhaps in panic and maybe in outrage. But those very words embody one of the greatest compliments that could ever be paid to the Apostle Paul. Wherever he went, Paul made an impact for Jesus Christ. In fact, if you have your Bible in front of you there, I know we're in Acts 17, but if you just turn back to Acts 13, I would just call your attention to a couple of the places that Paul has just visited. And we've covered this over the last few weeks. But in Acts chapter 13, Paul began his first missionary journey on the island of Cyprus. And the Bible tells us in Acts 13, verse 5, that they literally went through the entire island, as you read the story there, preaching the gospel to all the towns and cities and villages on the island of Cyprus. And when they had preached the, the gospel throughout the island, they moved on in chapter 13, and they went to a place called Pisidian Antioch. And I want you to see the response of the people in, in Acts 13. Take a look with me at verse 42. It says, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, that is, they were going out of the synagogue, the people kept begging them that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. And then look at verse 43. It says, the very next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. Well, after ministering in Pisidian Antioch, they moved on to a place called Iconium. And we read about what happened there in chapter 14. Look at Acts 14, verse 1. It says, In Iconium they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both Jews and of Greeks. And then they moved on to a city called Lystra. And in chapter 14, verses 8 through 11, we have the story, they healed a lame man. And remember what happened. The people were so impressed with that miracle that according to their local superstition and, and religious teaching, they literally thought that the Greek gods had come down to earth and they tried to worship Paul and Barnabas. But of course, they would have nothing of it. And then in chapter 14, verse 21, they move on to the city of Derbe. 
And notice what are, what's recorded there. Acts 14, verse 21, they made an impact in the city of Derby. It says, after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch. It seemed like wherever Paul and Barnabas went, the gospel was preached and lives were influenced and people came to know the Lord. And they moved on in Acts chapter 16, verses 12 to 15, to Philippi. We looked at that story last week. And the Philippian jailer, his entire household came to Christ. And another church was started. Paul truly was a man who changed the world, wasn't he? In fact, that's the title of this series in the book of Acts. We've called this series World Changers. Because it's the story of how the gospel and the preaching of God's men and women changed the ancient world. And so today in Acts 17, verses 1 through 15, we find five reasons why Paul was a man who changed the world. Let's look at these together. Acts chapter 17, would you notice with me, verses 1 and 2. Now when they had traveled... Through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Why did God use the Apostle Paul to change the world? Number one, it was because he had an evangelistic focus. An evangelistic focus. You see, every time that Paul went into a city, he went into a synagogue. Now, in verse 1, did you notice this? He happened to pass through two other cities. He didn't stop in either one of them, but he stopped in Thessalonica. Why did he do that? Well, most people believe that because it was because neither one of those first two cities had a synagogue. So when he came to Thessalonica and there was a synagogue, he stopped there. You say, well, why did he go to the synagogue? Well... Paul went to the town synagogue because he knew that there would be spiritually receptive people, and that's where they were most likely to be found, attending the synagogue. You see, Paul always had an evangelistic focus. He wanted people to meet Jesus Christ. So what did he do? He concentrated his efforts on those who were most likely to respond to the gospel. Now, there's an important lesson here for us as well today. How can we identify potentially spiritually receptive people? How can we find them? How can we identify them? Well, let me give you, let me give you a clue. Spiritually responsive people are often those, get this, experiencing a change point in their life. Often, people who are going to be more potentially open to hearing about the gospel are probably going through some sort of change in their life. Something new is happening. An event is causing things to change in their lives. Now, that change, that change point could be a a, a stressful event. Someone's going through a divorce. There's been a death in the family. Someone's lost their job. There's been financial stress, perhaps a health crisis, or maybe an addiction, any number of things. A change point can also be a positive experience, a marriage, the birth of a child, a promotion, or a family moves from one place to another. But here's the key to identifying a change point. Here it is. Notice this. Don't miss this today. A change point is a time when they are facing an event that is beyond themselves, and they're looking for help. They're probably facing something they've never experienced before. It's new. It's unfamiliar. They're not quite sure how to navigate this. And so it's something that is oftentimes beyond themselves, beyond their realm of experience, and they're looking for for help. They're looking for guidance, perhaps. 
Something new is, and different is happening in their lives, and they may not be quite certain how to handle it, how to respond to it. It's the guy at work who's going through a divorce. It's the neighbor who complains about her kids always being out of control. It could be your hairdresser complaining about her husband. You see, it's people that are going through change and events in their life that they're not quite sure how to handle and how to deal with. Now, how many people do you think in your life are experiencing a change point? If you think about all the people that you know, at least in a, on a first-name basis. It could be friends. It could be people you, you know as neighbors where you live. It could be people in the community where you do business. How many people tend to be going through a change point at one time or another in their life? Well, usually about 10 to 20% of the people that we know are probably experiencing somewhat of a life-changing event. And they may be, therefore, more receptive to a spiritual conversation. You say, well, how do I turn conversations in a spiritual direction? Well, that's a very good question. Because it's no problem for us to talk with people, you know, about the weather and things that are happening in our country and in the world and and maybe in our lives. But how do we turn the conversation in a spiritual direction? Well, one of the ways that I have found that's very, very helpful, is when someone shares with me a problem, something they're struggling with, I've sometimes asked them the question, well, have you ever thought about praying about that? Just to kind of throw something out there. And, you know, we don't know how God might be working in someone's heart and life. We don't know what God's been doing in their life prior to this conversation. And so by just saying, well, as they share a problem, a challenge, a difficulty, well, have you ever thought about praying about that? And just to see how they respond. They may be open, they may be closed, but at least it gives you an idea of the spiritual temperature of their heart by how they respond to just a simple question like that. And then I found that sometimes it's helpful to ask their permission. I always ask, may I share with you something that's been helpful to me? May I share with you something that's helped me? And if, if it has to do with a problem or something they're struggling with, I might share something with them, like Psalm 50, verse 15. Psalm 50, verse 15, has some very encouraging words. Let me read them to you. The Lord says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you, and you will honor me. So when we ask someone, well, have you ever thought about praying about that? You know, we might share with them a verse like this from the Bible. May I share a verse from the Bible with you? God invites us to call to him, to turn to him. Let me give you another one. This is another great verse. You might just share one, but here's another one. Jeremiah 33.3 is another one of those little verses. I like to think of these as kind of a spiritual snack. You know, we're not giving them the whole thing, but we're just giving them a little taste, just a little sample. Jeremiah 33, 3. Do you know what that says? Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Isn't that an encouraging passage? Someone's struggling with their marriage, they've lost a job, they need prayer, and the Lord invites us to call upon him. Jeremiah 33, 3, Psalm 50, verse 15. And then one other one is a great one is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Those are a couple of great verses that you can share with someone who may be struggling. And then another thing I've sometimes done when someone has shared a challenge with me, and depending on the circumstances and what's going on around, sometimes I've said, well, would it be all right? Could I just pray for you? You know, and I I have rarely ever, I think of all the times I've offered to do that, I may have had just one person ever say, no, they didn't want me to pray. I mean, 99% of the time, people will welcome If they're struggling with something, they will welcome the idea of being prayed for. You see, changing the world 
happens one person at a time. Let me give you a second reason as we come back to Acts 17 as to why Paul was a man who changed the world. Take a look with me, Acts 17 and verse 3. Paul has been reasoning with them for three Sabbaths. What was he doing in verse 3? Explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus, who I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. Why was Paul able to impact his world? Number two, because of the centrality of God's word. He kept the scripture central. It says in verse two, he was reasoning with them from the scriptures. You know, the Greek word reasoned comes from our English word meaning dialogue. In other words, Paul's approach was not to stand up and to present a formal sermon per se, but rather he would promote a discussion, facilitate interaction, and Paul would field questions and people would, 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 uh, would ask him various things and he'd respond and explain things and it was kind of a give and take. And in verse 3, it's kind of a, a summary. He was explaining to these people how Jesus had been the one to fulfill the Old Testament scriptures. And so I'm sure Paul would have appealed to such passages as Psalm 22 and Isaiah 56. Psalm 22 and Isaiah 56 both talk about the Lord's Messiah having to suffer. I'm sure he drew their attention, thirdly, to Psalm 16, which said that this Messiah would not only suffer and die, But in Psalm 16, he would rise from the dead. And so if you want to look at an interesting example of Paul's preaching and how he did this, you'll find uh, one of his first sermons is actually recorded for us in Acts 13. And you can actually see Paul at work, how he would use the Old Testament to help people understand who Jesus was. And again, he's speaking to Jewish people who have an Old Testament background. So he takes what they know about the past and he links it to Jesus who has recently come and explains how Jesus fulfilled the scriptures they were very familiar with in the Old Testament. You say, how can we share the gospel with someone today? Well, that's a wonderful question. Because we may not be speaking to Jewish people who have any kind of religious background whatsoever. But the Bible, the Word of God, is still very powerful. And if you've always wondered how to share the gospel with someone, I'm going to show you how to do it this morning. In fact, you can share the gospel with someone by simply using six verses of Scripture. And I want to give you the six passages of Scripture that I often use when I share the good news with someone. In fact, if you will ask, if you will look at these six verses with a person and simply ask the question, reread the verse and ask them, well, what does it say? Let me give you those six verses. Here's the first one. Romans 3.23 basically tells us all have sinned. All have sinned. That's where the gospel message starts. We start with the bad news first, don't we? All right, let me give you a second passage. Are you ready? Romans 3.23 is first. Secondly, Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23 says that sin brings death. Sin brings death. So first of all, all have sinned. We're all in the same boat. And the second thing we know is that sin results in death. We're all going to die physically. And that brings us to our third passage. Hebrews 9.27. Hebrews 9.27 tells us that judgment follows death. So think about this. Everybody has sinned. What do we have to look forward to as a result of sin? Death. And what happens after a person dies physically? Judgment. Now that's not a very positive outlook, is it? We call that the bad news. Now, the good news What is the good news? Romans 5.8. What does that tell us? Christ 
died in our place. That's Romans 5.8. Christ died for us. It begins with the word but. In contrast to the bad news, here's the good news. God sent his son to die on the cross for each and every one of us. Then notice John 1.12. John 1.12 tells us we must receive Christ. We have to have a personal relationship with him. You say, well, how do we receive Christ? Well, that takes us finally to the last scripture, Revelation 3.20. We receive him personally by inviting him into our lives. We must personally invite him into our hearts and our lives. Six verses. You can share the gospel with someone. You ought to have those verses written down somewhere in your Bible or on a card that you carry in your wallet or your purse. You could take it out and you could say, let me share with you how you can know God personally. Now, let's say you don't have a lot of time and and maybe you can't remember six verses. Could you remember one? Let me give you one verse. You want to share the gospel? One verse? Let me give you one verse evangelism. Take one of the verses right here, one of the six, the second one. Romans 6, 23. Do you know you can take that one verse and share the entire gospel with someone? What does Romans 6, 23 says? For the wages of sin is death. Wages, sin. What are the wages? What do we get paid for sin? Death. There's the bad news. But the rest of it's the good news. But the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God, now the good news, the free gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we have eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. There's the gospel. There's the bad news, the good news, all in one verse. Well, we need to to move along. But people who make an impact are those who have an evangelistic focus. They keep the scripture central. Let me show you number three, a third characteristic of the Apostle Paul. Acts 17, verse 4. What was the response? How did people respond to hearing the message of the gospel? It says in verse 4, And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Number three, expect people to respond. Now, not everyone is going to, but we need to expect that some people are going to respond. Why is that so? Because people are spiritually hungry. They've tried to fill the emptiness in their life in a variety of ways, and it hasn't worked. In fact, I want you to listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9. Write down this reference. Matthew 9, 37. Jesus said this about spiritually hungry people. He said, the harvest is plentiful. What's the problem? But the workers are few. In other words, according to Jesus, there are more people out there ready to respond to the gospel who want to meet God But there are not enough people to tell them, to show them the way. Therefore, Jesus says in verse 38, Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. There are spiritually hungry people out there. And when someone shares with you a change point that they're going through, you don't know what God may be doing to get them to that point. And so that's why it can be so Wonderful to just ask that key question. Have you ever thought about praying about that? Or let me give you another question you can ask as you're talking with someone. I did this just the other day. We had someone that was talking to us about solar. And I'd had several conversations. About the third time I was visiting with him, I asked him the question, because we were getting to know each other a little bit. And I said, you know, I haven't asked you this, but tell me, where are you at in your spiritual journey? Where are you in your spiritual journey? You know, that's a, that's a very open-ended question. 
It's assuming the best, and literally everybody is on a spiritual journey of some kind, whether they acknowledge it, understand it, or realize it or not. And so I asked him, where are you on your spiritual journey? And so he began to share this kind of these new age things that he was into, and, and I listened, and, and I didn't sense the Holy Spirit prompting me to go any further, but just that question opened up a discussion, an opportunity to talk about spiritual things. Where are you? In your spiritual journey can be a good question to ask. Well, let me share with you a fourth reason Paul was effective. Not only because he had an evangelistic focus, not only because he kept Scripture central and expected people to respond, but but now take a look at this in Acts 17, beginning in verse 5. But the Jews, becoming jealous... And taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. All right, number four. If you're going to be a world changer, you have to be prepared for some opposition. Because there probably will be some along the way. And notice, as the city became aware of the Apostle Paul and people were aroused, they made some vague charges about these missionaries who were there, that they were troublemakers, but they couldn't really substantiate that. And so by declaring that this individual named Jason had welcomed them, they were literally accusing him of harboring potential criminals under his roof. Now, the second charge was a little bit more important here and a little bit more serious because they were charging them with acts contrary to the decrees of Caesar. But watch this. What was the most important one? They were declaring another king other than Caesar, and to do so was a capital offense. Well, the most serious crime to suggest there was another God other than Caesar. You say, well, how did they get out of this mess? Well, apparently, Jason had given them some kind of a pledge. We don't know exactly what it is, but maybe he pledged to the local authorities that these men would never set foot in the city again. So whatever it was, whatever he was able to say, he was able to persuade them that these visitors would not remain there, and they released them. The point is, is that sometime along the way, we may have some opposition as we share the gospel. We shouldn't be surprised by it. Sometime back, I received a letter from a pastor, and he is leading a church in a very difficult uh, country of the world. He pastors a Christian and Missionary Alliance church in the city of Baghdad in Iraq. Imagine that. And from time to time, he himself faces some opposition. In fact, on one of those occasions, he wrote this letter I wanted to read to you. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, blessings. Today, I met a brigadier general from the Iraqi army. He told me that they have information about unknown groups that want to murder me. A pastor was killed two days ago beside his home. There is persecution going on against pastors in our country. I pushed everything into the care of God. And I trust that he will protect me and my family. And I want to continue to be obedient to his call. The brothers in the church advised me to leave Baghdad for a while with my family. Now many brothers from the church are beside me, 
to encourage me and to pray with me. They have decided to stay and protect me until I'm able to leave. Please, I need your prayers. I need wisdom from our Lord. I tried to buy tickets, but the airplane was filled. Well, as we can imagine, there wouldn't necessarily be an awful lot of flights probably going in and out of Iraq and Baghdad. And so for this man even to get some measure of safety, it would be difficult for him even to, in some cases, buy plane tickets. So the brothers and the people of the church were banding together with him, hopefully to protect him. But imagine that. Preaching the gospel in the city of Baghdad has led some groups to begin to target Christian pastors. Well, what are world changers like? They have an evangelistic focus, don't they? They keep the scriptures central. They expect people to respond because people are spiritually hungry. They are prepared for a certain amount of opposition. But then look at this next one, number five, and this is the last one. Don't be discouraged. Don't allow discouragement to rule your heart. Well, Paul certainly could have allowed discouragement in his life. Look at verses 10 to 15 as we wrap up today. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica, where they had just been, found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowd. See, there's the opposition. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. So isn't it interesting? Paul is thrown out of Thessalonica, but even though he might have been discouraged, there was encouragement right around the corner because you know something? After every Thessalonica, there's a Berea. And he goes to Berea and there's a tremendous response. And the Bible says that the people were even examining the scriptures to see. They were studying the Bible. They were so interested in what Paul had to say. Don't be discouraged. You know, sometimes life can make us discouraged, can't it? And I know because of all that we've gone through during this last year, some people have been discouraged by this pandemic. They've been discouraged by what's happened in their life or in their family. I want to share with you this little story it's a fictional story, obviously, but it reminds us of how powerful discouragement can be in a negative way in a person's life. The story goes like this. There was a time when the devil was setting up all of his tools and he was selling them. Each item had its own appropriate price on it. The tools included such things as hatred, envy, Jealousy, deceit, lying, pride, so forth and so on. But apart from all of these tools, there was one other tool, and it was over here all by itself. And it had an, exp uh, an especially high price tag on it. And someone asked the devil why this tool, sitting over here by itself, had such an expensive price attached to it. And the devil said, ah... That's because this tool is my most important tool. It's the tool of discouragement. He said, I can pry open a man's heart when nothing else will work with discouragement. And once inside, I can make him do whatever I choose. Discouragement. 
Perhaps some of you have been feeling discouraged lately. Perhaps as you have gone through this pandemic, it seems like it will never end. And, and it just seems like good news is, is just not on the, the most recent horizon. And so we tend to go through days like this and sometimes we feel defeated. And we feel despondent. And we feel discouraged. And we feel like giving up. But you know something we need to remember? We serve a God of hope. We are going to get through this. Because after a Thessalonica, there will be a Berea. Good times are coming. Because God knows exactly what he's doing. In fact, you know what God is doing in our world today? God is getting people ready for heaven. And he's using people just like us to share that good news with some who are defeated and who are feeling discouraged. And they're needing hope. They're needing the hope of the gospel. And you know what? God is getting people ready for heaven. And I want to close today by just sharing with you a little vision of what our heavenly home is going to be like. You know, there's some amazing stories out there today of people who have had what we call near-death experiences. And they've caught a glimpse of heaven. And the Lord has brought them back, and they've, shared, they've been sharing some of these stories, and they've been written up, and they give us such an amazing picture, a glimpse of what glory is going to be like. I thought you might just enjoy hearing a little snapshot of what heaven is might be like. Sit back and listen to this. I was fast approaching a magnificent city, golden and gleaming among a myriad of resplendent colors. The light I saw was the purest I had ever seen, and the music was the most majestic, enchanting, and glorious I had ever heard. Now we heard some good music today, but just imagine what the music of heaven will be like. I was overwhelmed by its beauty. It was breathtaking, this city, and a strong sense of belonging filled my heart. The entire city was bathed in light, an opaque whiteness in which the light was intense but diffused. In that dazzling, dazzling light, every color imaginable seemed to exist. And what's the right word? Played. The colors seemed to be alive, dancing in the air. I had never seen so many different colors. It was breathtaking to watch. The closer I got to the city, the more distinct the illumination became. The magnificent light I was experiencing emanated from about 40 or 50 miles within the city wall itself. Remarkably, the light didn't shine on things, but rather through them. I saw light shining through the grass, through the trees, through the wall, and through the people who were gathered there. There was a huge gathering of angels and people, millions, countless millions. They were gathered in a central area that seemed over 10 miles in diameter. The expanse of people was closer to an ocean than a concert hall. Waves of people moving in the light, swaying to the music, worshiping the God of heaven. Now, doesn't that sound fantastic? Well, he's not done. Let me read just a little more. Between the central part of the city and the city walls were groupings of brightly colored, picture-perfect homes in small, quaint towns. Maybe you've wondered, where are we going to live in heaven? Well, this might be something describing what that'll be like. Each home was customized and unique from the others, yet blended harmoniously together. 
Some were three or four stories. Some were even higher. There were, no, there were no two exactly the same. The city wall stretched out to my left and as far as I could see to my right in both directions. A powerful light permeated the wall and you could see all the colors of the rainbow in it. The flowers in heaven fascinated me. A delightful and delicate balance between diversity and unity. Each petal and leaf illuminated with that glorious light and added just the right splashes of color to the velvety expanse of the green grass. The grass, the sky, the walls, the houses, everything was more beautiful than I had ever dreamed anything could be. Even the colors. They were richer, deeper, more luminescent than any colors I had ever seen in the farthest reaches of earth or in the most fantastic of dreams. They were so vibrant, they literally pulsated with life. Heaven is worth waiting for. Heaven is what God is getting ready people for. And he's using the gospel and he's using us to continue to share the good news. I love the book of Acts because it's not the end of the story. The story continues. We continue to be, as God's people, the unfolding story of the book of Acts today. And my question for you, perhaps you're watching on your television, you're finding this message online. Do you know Jesus Christ in a personal way? I want to invite you, perhaps you've never prayed this prayer with me, but I'd like you to pray this prayer with me today. It's a prayer of invitation. Would you like to know God personally? You can, right now, right here, right this moment. Would you bow with me? And in your heart, perhaps either silently or aloud, would you pray this prayer of invitation, inviting Jesus into your heart as Savior? Lord Jesus, I need you. I open the door of my life and invite you to come in. Forgive me for all my sin. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Thank you for coming into my life today as you promised you would. And thank you for giving me eternal life with you. Amen. Well, God is good. And remember how we started this worship experience today. We said the Apostle Paul's words, the suffering of this present time cannot be compared with the glory that is to come. Well, we look forward to that. We thank you for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. Until then, the Lord bless. <laughs>